Today on Creatives Almanac, we've got Koji Aiken. Hello. He is a digital marketer. He is a founder of an events company that is starting to build itself in Vancouver. Um, and he's just a really great guy. He's been a loyal friend <laughs> for, the past, year? for the past year. Yeah. So I kind of want to rewind like way, way back and kind of go into who was Koji um, if I was sitting beside you in like elementary school. Oh. Like... You know, today you're a very outgoing person. Were you the same person back in elementary school or were you a little more conservative? Were you very studious? What kind of kid were you? Uh, definitely, I was, I was the kid making a lot of noise, for sure. <laughs> like, I, like you said, I was very outgoing and very, like, out there. But, like, I just wasn't as refined. Do you know what right. I mean? Like, yeah. I was just all over the place. My energy was spilling everywhere. It was like always, but it was always like a positive, like very optimistic kind of like trying to make the play everything around me like a better place. Like I think that's something that's always like stuck through to me, and that's something like my dad taught and drilled into me. Um, but it was a lot like I guess socially messy. Like I just did, didn't really follow the social rules a lot. Like I would be disrupting class, like class clown kind <laughs> of thing. Like. Um, yeah, like I just remember one time, for example, um, like I would just like bang my head. Like there's this one class I remember where I just like bang my head as hard as I could on my desk when I was in grade six or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> just because like, A, I thought it was like hilarious and I thought people would laugh at me and they did. But they were also just like, dude, like, are you OK? And like looking back at it now, it's just like that was definitely not socially acceptable behavior, but it was funny. You know what I mean? <laughs> now I think I've refined the socially acceptable behavior and but still hold that kind of like very playful and like very uh, outward upbringing energy. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I think it's a lot about making people happy, making people laugh. I mm -hmm. think that's a huge part of, of what we need in this world, too. It's like definitely, yeah, we definitely need that. Um, I mean, you mentioned your dad. Um, tell us a little bit about who your dad was and how he influenced you in your life. Oh, yeah. So I think my dad is definitely my number one influence for who I am today because, uh, like, like, I mean, just going from the start, like, he's a juggler, he's an entertainer, he's a comedian. Like, that was his whole job, but he never really switched off. So it was like having a juggler, a comedian, and an entertainer for a dad as well, which I thought was a very unique upbringing. And it was just, like, it really was an amazing experience to have. Like, he was always just so outgoing, like, over the top. Like, I remember, like, his catchphrase to, like, any time to anyone who asked him about his day was, I'm just living the dream. Like, <laughs> living the dream. Like, not just, like, oh, yeah, today's a good day. It was, like, I'm living the dream. And just, I think just seeing him have that much, energy and that much enthusiasm about life really inspired me to live life to that extent as well and um you know and then on on the other side too is like any time that i wanted to do like any pursuit of mine whether it was like a new project or you know doing sports or you know even just like a small little idea like he was always super encouraging about it because he knew that if it was something that I wanted to do, it was something that was going to make me happy and he wanted to support that 100%. So, um, yeah, being my number one influence and my number one fan is That's how he awesome. kind of uh, is the role he played in my life. That's an amazing foundation. Totally, yeah. And that explains a lot about your enthusiasm <laughs> today. Like, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, was it a bit hard, too, to have that as, a, um, that as an influential figure? And, um, I mean, like, a lot of fathers are very strict. And so that builds a lot of discipline in some kids. Yet you still have discipline. Did he yeah. still build that discipline value, or is that something you got from somewhere else? I, I think it's I got it from like uh, a lot of my outward experiences and stuff. Um, definitely one of the biggest one was the playing football and just having like a coach who was very like 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 my my, my dad even said it himself. He he isn't like a very like masculine like like these are the rules like you got to live like this kind of guy. He was like very free flowing and very uh open to to a lot of the things which which gave me the freedom to do to really figure out what i wanted to do but um in in doing so like i found different areas in my life that taught me how to be disciplined and like one that comes to mind was just like football right um and uh, oh and my grade five teacher grade five teacher. yeah like for Ooh, some detail. reason um in grade five is when i made the switch between um uh, 
like just living life and enjoying life. And it's because I had this teacher who was just like a hard ass. Oh, interesting. Um, and, and she was like, like, it was almost just like I wasn't allowed to have fun. And that was kind of my first taste of like, like, yo, we got to do work here. Like, you got to be like doing work and like, you got to get it done. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, and I never, I felt like I just never had that before. So it kind of like switched a flick on my brain and everything since then. It's just kind of been like, um, you know, I've just been very organized and very like deadline oriented and kind of, uh, like you said, just disciplined because of, that, that was a starting point. Like, obviously there's been many more experiences like that, that have like led to me being disciplined, but like, yeah, like definitely think like, that, that was part of it. That in football. I noticed a lot of, it's a lot of teachers and coaches um, mm-hmm. that really influence your life. Like, oh, absolutely. It's crazy to see how much, um, like, you know, everyone says, oh, it's the parents, it's the parents, but really it's, it's about who you surround yourself with uh, when you're a kid too and what schools you go to and whatnot. So that's really cool. Yeah. Like, so your grade five teacher, were, were they like, <laughs> were they, I'm just trying to understand like what kind of person, were, were they very strict and upset all the time or was it like more of like a, um, hey, like you should really be focusing on this. No, like, what, it was on the you? first one for yeah. sure. Like, it, like she just wasn't any fun. Like, she oh, just, it just kind of <laughs> like, um, like it, 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 she, it just kind of seemed like she just always had a stick up her ass. Yeah, I guess like she just <laughs> didn't know how to have fun. And um, I remember my dad like during the parent teacher interviews or something. One of the comments that he received from this teacher was, "Koji needs to learn the difference between silly and funny." You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I think to any normal person, that makes sense, you know, like, silly is, like, very, like, like, it doesn't, it's not socially right. acceptable, but, right. like, funny is, and then my dad just kind of looked at her, and he's like, what are you talking about, like, what's the difference, you know <laughs> what I mean, like, <laughs> I, I really, and I think that really is a show of character, of like, who he is, and maybe a little bit of his disconnect from the real world as well, but, like, also, um, why he was so special. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, awesome. But yeah, no, definitely grade five teacher was, um, she was stiff. Yeah. To say the least. And so like you were, you were in grade school at this time. Um, you saw your dad a lot. Um, did you ever work with your dad? Did you work with your oh, dad Oh yeah, tons. Like, um, you know, having such a influential and special dad like that, like it obviously made me want to do what he was doing. Right. So growing up, I learned how to like juggle he taught me how to unicycle he taught me like all these like tricks and stuff like I there was a point where like I wanted to be my dad um and I was lucky enough where like he would bring me along for like shows and we'd like set up like tag shows and stuff um and like I got to work with him on stage uh a couple of times and like that was definitely a really really cool experience and I think it built the foundation for uh me being a performer because I love being in front of an audience and I love being in front of people and then uh, like you said, like I love, um, or you were mentioning before, just like having that outward uh, energy and like entertaining people, making people feel happy. Like I think I, I drive a lot of that from those experiences. And that's super interesting too, because um, like I don't know if you remember too much of those times, your feelings and the things you've learned, or if you're able to dissect it really mm. at that age. But like I'm sure being in front of people, you almost subconsciously or even consciously just learned a couple of t- tips and tricks on how to perform in front of people and how to be in front of people. Oh, absolutely. And present yeah. yourself. Yeah, I think it's just like practice, right? Like, and especially like being in a situation where you are at the center of attention and you hold not just like one or two people's attention, but like an audience's attention, like that is a really high pressure situation for a lot of people. And I think uh, just being exposed to that so many times has helped me navigate how to really... Um, I don't want to say manipulate, but just like, just influence the audience, influence the audience. Exactly. Them on a trip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've done it in like so many different kind of mediums as well. You know, it started off as like juggling and being a little performer kid into, um, dancing. Like I was a dancer in high school as well. Um, and so I did a lot of like performances in front of people and then, and then eventually turned into DJing and yeah. playing in front of people and playing music. So that's but awesome. I think like all those experiences did contribute to me learning how to be in front of someone or in front of a group of people and entertaining them, right? Awesome. Mm-hmm. So you said that, you know, when you were younger, you really wanted to become an entertainer uh, like your father. You yeah. wanted to become your father. Yeah. When did that start to change? When were you like, well, there's a lot of things I could be and there's so much opportunity out there. Let me explore what else, you know, right. what else I could be. 
Um, well, it started, I think it really came down to, um, like, probably when I was around, like, 13 or 14 or so, um, when I started doing, like, street shows and, like, started busking out in front of people. Like, I would go over to, um, there's this little key called Bonsdale Key in North Vancouver, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I would set up, like, I'd have my little box of, like, props and stuff. I'd go down, like, dressed up, and um, I would just busk and had a little show and everything and go out. And um, one of the things I realized I always had difficulty was um, just like getting started with it. Um, and I wasn't sure if it was because of like the anxiety of getting started or like I needed an audience beforehand to like feel comfortable in my space, but it's just, I really just couldn't get over that part of like being an or being a street performer and a busker. And um, it kind of pushed me away from the whole thing because I just had like so much friction with that aspect of it. So um, I kind of, and that was around the time that I started like doing dance and like other, exploring like other areas of my life. And um, just dance was a lot easier for me because like the audience is already there, you know, or I was performing in front of people in like a theater. So like everyone was already seated. There was already an audience. Like I didn't have to worry about building the crowd or whatever. And um, it just like for me, like it, it gave me all the aspects of being an entertainer without having to worry about building the crowd. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Interesting. And so busking, how long did you do that for? Like, did, was it did it last a few months? Did it last a few years? It was a couple of years, I wow. think. Um, like maybe like a year or two. Um, but and, and that was like in between like me like performing with my dad and kind of just doing whatever. But I think it came to a point where. I think it was around like 13, I think, I think what it was was around like 13, 14 was when I started to build my own identity of like who I was and what I wanted to be, and who I wanted to be and stuff. And um, uh, I had, like I said, my dad just gave me the freedom to like really explore and, and figure out what it was. And I just, I started to develop a little bit of independence of who I was. Um, and I didn't have to like latch on so much to this, my father's identity because I also, I had like other options and stuff right. that made a little bit more sense with, yeah. I think, um, who I was as a, as a person, um, kind of the environment that I was like raised in and the environment that, gr that I grew up in and uh, the people that I was surrounded with, right? Like um, my dad, like growing up, he was like very, uh, from what I've heard anyways, he was very set on, you know, being a juggler and he was very, like that was his passion and his dream and like, he knew that's what it was wanted to do. So he spent a lot of time alone, like practicing and whatnot, whereas me, it's like, I had a lot of friends who were interested in other things like music and dance and I love being around people. So like I got influenced and I wanted to do things with them that, and I didn't really have a lot of juggler friends you know, right, growing yeah. up. <laughs> uh, it's not very common these days. That's so. fair. Yeah. Yeah. I that's really cool. I mean, frick, busking must be like, I can imagine that that's a very difficult job to be in. The closest thing I can relate it to is like sales, like door to door sales. Like you yeah. are putting yourself out there all the time, really trying to make an effort and, and you only get a certain amount of people that really buy in. So I think mm -hmm. that that's also really a big discipline building um, job too. I mean, you have to have <laughs> the grit to be able to stay there and be like, I am not stopping until I get, you know, these people's attention and, and I'm happy with that. So exactly, that's, yeah. that's really respectable. And I see how that kind of built you up to who you are today and that kind of built a really important skill in you. Yeah. So then out of high school, you go to UBC yeah. um, and you're the events director for multiple organizations. So right. I'm trying to understand how you got from, um, you know, how you got from uh, entertainment, busking, trying to be like your father, um, getting into dance into suddenly going into events. Like when did you start understanding that events is something you're really passionate about? Uh, that's, that's a great question, actually. So, um, going into UBC, uh, I was still very passionate about dance. I hadn't touched like music or DJing or anything at this point. So, um, and you know, I think as we mentioned earlier, like I like being the center of attention, um, yeah. you know, through busking and through just growing up as a kid. And so, uh, I really utilized that skill of dancing at like parties at UBC, you know, like I wanted to make a great first impression on everyone around me and whatnot. So I would always be the one like, at parties, like break up little dance circle and then just like nice. bust a move, right? Uh, <laughs> um, which was so much fun at the time, you know, and I love the energy. It was it was almost like a different form of entertainment. It's like a little bit more raw than like having a seat at theater. It was like, you had to like 
read the crowd and what the energy was and really just like be out there and so I, I ended up doing that a lot at like bars and clubs and you know like just the b-boy at fortune or whatever <laughs> <laughs> on those dirty greasy vodka crown stained floors <laughs> <laughs> um but um yeah i think uh because of that like i actually got picked up by one of the djs at one of the parties that i was at and he goes by the name of uh, dj demo uh, Brent Mosher, and um, he was in the same faculty as me, and uh, I think he saw something within me that that uh, or he saw I, I don't know I don't really know what he saw in me to be honest, but I think um, <laughs> he he just saw like a spark in me, and he was just like, um, hey man, like you got like wicked moves and stuff, like do you want to like learn how to DJ? And I was just like, oh, like that sounds awesome, you know what I mean? <laughs> like I like at that point it, it never really crossed my mind that I. Um, wanted to do something like that or that I even could do something like that so um for him to give me an opportunity like that I would just like and I was still like very fresh you know like I was still not very influenced I still didn't know what I was doing at EBC or whatever um but so I, I took the opportunity and he like gracefully gracefully brought me under his wing gave me a couple sessions and whatnot and uh he was just like yeah like dude i've got this gig with like this like formal that i'm playing at like do you want to like open for me and i was just like dude what yeah like that's a dream come true um so uh i did that and then i think i i, I don't really remember too much about that gig i know like i messed up a, a couple of times and um like it definitely was not a good performance at all i will say that from the bottom of my heart it was a terrible performance <laughs> but the thing that that he saw i think he saw um, that I know I felt was just like how excited and how like into it I was. And I think when you find something like that in your life, it's super important to chase it. So, um, maybe he saw that within me as well. And he was also the, uh, I think he was, um, he was a DJ with the calendar. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and from that, I guess the passion that he saw within my eyes, he saw, he could like, kind of like, uh, just develop it and and kindle it a little bit right so he started giving me some more opportunities with the calendar which is like a the biggest events company at ubc at the time and uh i kind of got integrated with that group and then just because like those were like my real only dj opportunities and i was like so so hungry to like play i um kind of just like followed that path and got more involved with them and then kind of rose the ranks from like uh, a talent manager to uh the events director there. Nice. And and then I was kind of like my in with events, and I think I think what it really comes down to, and how how I got involved in the event space was because of my love of DJing and performing, and events is and being in, involved in the event space is an avenue for me to do that. Okay, so a couple questions um, to dissect this <clears throat> kind of crossover. Yeah. When DJ Demo came up to you um, and offered you an opportunity to learn about DJing. Was that something you knew at that time was going to be something that was going to be a big part of your life? Oh, hell no. No, 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 no. It was, it was just like another cool like opportunity at the yeah. time. And I think I was just very um, malleable mm -hmm. or like I hadn't uh, developed really a strong identity at university yet. So, um, yeah, I was just still like open minded to like trying all these different things. And um, it was just like another opportunity that came by and I was just like, yeah, like this sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. Right. And um it wasn't until like the first couple of gigs and like being in front of people where I was just like, oh, like this, we might be onto something, you know, <laughs> like this might be it. And um, so, yeah, like I definitely think it was like the first couple of shows that like had me figured out. But like right at first, it was like, I had no clue. Yeah. Well, that's super interesting because I feel like a lot of people close opportunities off because they don't see a future in it. Mm -hmm. When in reality, maybe when you're in university or even after university, you don't even know really what your future might be or what your future might, what your future might hold. I think that's a really poor philosophy to hold to like close yourself off from any opportunity. Like you don't really know what can come out of any anything that you do, right? Like even if it's completely out of your comfort zone or something that doesn't really align with your current vision, like I think just having an open mind and trying things can lead to opening doors to places that you never thought you would ever be. 100%. And so I think that's really cool that you took that leap and you're like, okay, you know what? I don't see this happening. You know, I don't see this becoming anything, but you know what? I really like it. I like the idea. I feel good about it. Let's try it out. Yeah, absolutely. I think just like diving into it and just, just like 
like I said, just having an open mind about it, like you don't really know what's going to come out of it. Um, and as long as it makes you feel like, I think, I think the thing that people have trouble with these days a lot is like listening to what makes them feel good. Right. Like, and cause, cause it might not seem like the right thing to do cause it might not make the money or it doesn't really, you know, it conflicts with a lot of like other things that they think they need. But like, really, if you just follow that, that feeling in your heart of, oh, this makes me feel really, really good. I want to keep doing it. Like, I can guarantee you, you're going to go places that'll make you happy, which I think at the end of the day is, is what we all want, right? 100%. Yeah. And so when he first approached you, were you, um, how did you, how did you respond to it? Were you um, kind of shy about it or were you just like all in head first? Let's try this out. No, yeah, definitely the latter for yeah. sure. Like I, I was just excited that someone, um, acknowledged me and just yeah. like acknowledged that they saw potential in me and I like almost didn't want to let them down you know what I mean like I, I just like took the I was just like whoa like you think I have the ability and potential to do this or because because he saw me as like a dancer first and it was just like may, maybe in his head he's like this could translate well into DJing or whatever or, or maybe it was the energy that I had like oh this guy would be like super fun behind the decks like but the fact that he like saw something and believed in me I was just like that like fired me up I was like let's go cool. like let's <laughs> let's do this you know what i mean like if someone else believes i can do it then who's to say that i can't do it 100%, right yeah so i think that that's kind of the that, that that's how it all happened for me that's amazing mm -hmm. and so what was the first event where you actually felt um proud of that you felt proud of maybe it didn't make money or maybe it wasn't a big hit but what was the first event you felt very proud of and what happened a good I, I was probably like the second or third event after that first one. Mm -hmm. um, it was at Kerner's Pub. Okay. Um, good old Kerner's. The good old Kerner's Pub. Um, I, I mean, first of all, like Kerner's is a beautiful, beautiful venue. Mm -hmm. And like the fact that it was like in the summer and it was outside, like I was playing an opening slot between like nine and 11, I think it was. Um, so there's like no one there for the first hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like the fact that like I, had, I was given an opportunity to like have fun and build this and like showcase this talent that I just started like um like that got me super excited and like um you know the month leading up to it like I'd been practicing a lot and like I was super fired up and I was just like it was like when you find um like it's like it's like when a kid finds a new toy and they're like super jazzed about it like <laughs> and then they like go deeper and deeper deeper into the rabbit hole it was like that was like what DJing was for me at first cool. and and then it's like maybe the kid at show and tell like gets to show off that toy. It was like, that's what my first gig felt like. I was just so excited just to even have the opportunity there. And um, when, you know, it wasn't until like the last half an hour that people started showing up and the crowd started to build and whatnot. But the fact that I had, that just this, the influence that I saw that I had with music and just making people move and, and connecting everyone and making everyone in that space experience the same thing was like, I don't know. It's just like something clicked for me there. I was just like, like all the parts that I liked about like busking or dancing in front of people or just, just making people feel good. Like all the part, the best parts of all those things were like right there in that moment. I was just like, like it just clicked. I was like, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. You know what I mean? Like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. That's awesome. Yeah. Like, and, and I'm like so grateful for that because I know like it doesn't really happen for a lot of people or it happens like very late for a lot of people, you know, like I know, I know a lot of my friends are still struggling to figure out like what they want to do. And for me to have found something that I love and fills me with so much joy and, and gives me so much certainty about who I am and what I love doing, like that is truly a blessing and a half. Especially in university, being able to find that in university. Hmm. Me and Kevin were talking about this and yeah. it's like, he, he found a lot of people in university crying at the lunch table because they have to switch the degree, you know, halfway through their <laughs> halfway through their um, university career, yeah. and and people are just distraught by that. Um, and so, how did you go about? What did you take in university? I how took kinesiology, so like yeah. completely, yeah, completely a left field, like yeah. from what I was doing at the time. And how did you, like, I guess, how did you choose that area of study, and and how important did you think that area of study was going to be towards your life? Uh, well, I, I definitely, it was, I was very influenced by when I was like dancing and playing a lot of football and mm -hmm. I was like being super physically active. Um, that's, I, I had a coach, like a kinesiology coach come in and like, kind of just like 
just do some like minor tweaks on my body and just being like, yeah, like you should move like this or like you should do these exercises and like the performance change in it, I would just be blown away. So um, at that time, I was just like, oh, this seems like a really good thing to to get into because it really lines up with my my very physically active life. And um, I feel like I could learn a lot from it. Um, so going into university, I thought I was going to be like a physio or Cairo or like a sports doctor or whatever. Um, and and that clearly didn't happen. <laughs> I, I completely took a, a different path in a row. But I definitely think... Um, it is still holds like a really, really strong influence. Like just everything I learned about like being healthy and having a good mind and a good body and the importance of those things has contributed to me being able to perform at the best of my abilities. Nice. Yeah. So I definitely like, even though it is like a little bit unrelated, I do still think it's had like a very heavy influence on where I am today and how, how I'm able to do what I am able to do. I love that. Mm-hmm. Really? No. But yeah, so like you took kinesiology and yeah. and you realize that that's going to help you in life, but it's not necessarily going to be your career choice down the road. No. And so I think that I think that's a really strong mindset and I think that, you know, stress kills and if you're just stressing about something that isn't going to be that important at the end of the day, I think that's something that you should really realize and say, you know what? Let's um let's take it easy on this and just focus on what I'm passionate about and take school to really learn about things that I think will help me down the road. Yeah, well, I, I'm kind of of the school of thought that like every opportunity has something to teach you, right? And so you should approach everything that you do with 100% because um, you are going to learn things. Like, it doesn't really matter if it, if it doesn't relate to like what you want to do right now or if it doesn't align with you as a person like there are hidden lessons between in everything everything that you do in life and if and for me it's just to I I think it's just a waste to not seize those opportunities to like learn and grow as a person even though some of these things like might take a lot of work and it might suck you know what I mean like I, I think it was um like when I started to like learn discipline and stuff through football and stuff, it really taught me that like sometimes you're just going to have to do the work. And like once you do the work, like there will be something at the end of it all. Like maybe not something that you imagine, you know, maybe you work like 20 hours and only make $200, but you met three really dope people that'll help you somewhere else. Right. And there's value behind that. 100%. that that's just an example. So what was one thing, if you were to go back to university and say, you know, I, I would want to do something better or I'd want to do something less, maybe, what was what would be one thing you'd want to change in your university experience? Chasing girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like uh, yeah, like, it was fun. And I, like yeah. university is the time to do that. But like, I feel like I wasted so much time just chasing <laughs> girls that I just didn't care about. Right. Um, just just because I was just like there's this huge like hookup culture at UBC or I guess in any university or college that like you need to go out and just like um you know get as many kills as possible or whatever right and it's just I kind of bought into that a little heavy and I feel like I wasted a couple of weekends yeah. just <laughs> where I could have been doing something else you know what I mean or like right. I, I could have gotten a good sleep <laughs> <laughs> like not I, like not to say that like, I regret any any of the decisions that I made but I definitely think that like my, my time and energy could have been spent a little wiser. What I've said. No, that's true. I mean, I mean, you want to keep up with the status of other people, so I think that's a big part of it too. Like, 100%. Yeah. Like, you, you don't want to be the kid at the class that has the, the least kills, or <laughs> right. you know what I mean? But 100%. like, you also don't want to be the most. You, you don't want to be the most. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta find that balance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then you graduate from university. Yeah. Um, you have a degree in kinesiology and you have a lot of really good experience with the different organizations like the calendar like the plug that you have oh, the plug for. as well yeah um and so you have all these great connections these great experiences what's the first thing what's the first thought out of your head coming out of university what do you what's your plan uh well this is around the time that COVID had like just started because right. i graduated um in 2020 and uh, covid had hit like like lockdowns had hit a month before uh, I graduated. So, uh, I didn't get like a big year end like, congratulations. Like you made it five years through like <laughs> some ridiculous schooling and, and partying and this crazy big experience It's very anticlimactic. Right. And, um, so I feel like when I left school, like I lost a huge part of my identity and including events, like not being able to do events, not being able to DJ or anything, which was a huge part of my identity as well. 
I had a girlfriend at the time and we decided to split. So um, really like everything kind of just got swept off the table for me for like right after I graduated. So I was kind of just left with a clean slate, um, which at the time was like really difficult to process just because I didn't know what to do with my life at that point. Um, but it also gave me the space to really figure out what it was that truly meant a lot to me, right? And like what, what I, what, what was left, you know what I mean? Like, cause there was a lot of noise. There was a lot of just extra stuff happening around me that like I didn't necessarily need to pay attention to. And, and really this gave me a chance to like take a step back and be like, okay. And like, and look at my life and where I was. And I'd just be like, Hey, like, what do you want to do? Like, like forget about everything else that's going on. Like, what do you as Koji want to do with your life? And the things that really kind of like stuck with me were something to do with music and something to do with bringing people together. Um, so that summer I kind of, uh, I really dove deep into like music production and, and learned how to spend a lot more time with myself and learned a lot about, um, I, I think I just became a lot more aware of me and myself and who I am as a person and just learning to like listen to myself. Um, because there were like a lot of like difficult days and a lot of times where I was like really down on myself. Um, and just being able to have that time and space to like really be like, l just listen and, and kind of understand who I was like helped me a lot, you know? Um, and then obviously like events and stuff started like opening up again. And, um, yeah, that summer I didn't really know what to do. I was kind of just like floating through the universe cause I had nothing to like latch onto. And then in, uh, I think it was August of that summer is when I started working with you yeah, at 7 Studio 710 and, and things started to click a lot more. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. What are some things that got you, um, that pushed you through like maybe some ideas or hopes or maybe mantras that really pushed you through that time where you weren't sure what exactly was going to go, what was going to happen? Yeah, well, uh, I think like, like, I'll go back to like one one of the reasons why like I started like making music and stuff was um, I was sitting in the forest just hanging out listening to music as as you do in North Vancouver um, and I was just like listening to Kid Cudi and I had a realization that you know I could do anything that I want in my life. Um, this is also like another crazy transition period where I was coming out of high school and going into university, but like I, I just kind of like sat down and like had this crazy realization that like if I like really put my mind to something, anything, the, anything in the world, like I could probably figure it out and make it work. And I think that mentality really helped me get through that time period when COVID had just started or when the, the lockdowns had just started was it, it was the same thing. It was like it, it came down to like music. Like I if I really want if I really, really want this. I can figure it out. I just need to put in the time and the work and the effort and like everything will figure itself out. Like I don't really have, I can't read the future. I can't see the future. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I know that like if this is something, and it goes back to that thing of this is something that makes me feel good. It makes me feel happy. Like this is something that I need to chase and pursue and eventually like things will start to make sense mm -hmm. as we progress. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like one of the things that really got me through that time. Just not really having a goal or a direction, but, but just like working on something that like I loved working on. Right. And having that confidence where it's like, you know what, if I really put my mind to it and my grind to it, I'll be able to do it. Definitely. And anyone I think could, yeah. and anyone can like, I think that's something that like a lot of people and society just doesn't teach you is mm -hmm. that you could literally do anything you want. Like it doesn't matter what it is. Like it could, it could be a chef. You could be, um, you know, you can be an influencer, you can be famous if you really wanted to, right? Like, it doesn't really matter who you are or where you come from. I think it's just everyone needs to, like, have that belief in themselves that they can do whatever they want. 100%. I love that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and then we're, we meet at Studio 710. Uh, yeah. We start some live streams. We start working together there. Mm -hmm. um, what was going through your mind at that time? Like, what were you... I mean, I, I remember you felt like some gears engaging. You felt things were starting to move again, even though yeah. it was COVID. We were doing some things online um, that was still building the EDM community. Right. Um, what was happening in your mind during that time? With well, the whole reason, the, doing the, like the DJ live streams and stuff was was definitely a way to like get connected with the community, uh, especially like the electronic music community, which I hadn't been like too too tapped into quite at the time because I was like more, you know, it, 
into like the, the Granville Strip hip hop scene or like the UBC college scene or whatever. And, but I knew that like electronic music was something that I always wanted. I always had like a really deep desire and passion for, and I just never had the time or the energy to really put into it until, you know, we started working in the studio together. And I thought, you know, like DJing, like there's a huge, huge DJ community in Vancouver that just is so untapped and unsupported. And I thought like, you know, why not build a platform for all these amazing people and all the people that I had met uh, leading up to that point. And so my mindset at that point wasn't really like, okay, like we're going to become like, we're going to become the next big thing or like we're going to do anything. It was more just like, let's just find cool people and like start something awesome and build a community and, and kind of do my own thing. Cause I think, um, and the thing that I think derived from that was, um, working with these different event organizations and these, these different groups, like they had built like a really tight knit, awesome community that, that they could like influence and, and direct and do some like major scale things that not any individual could do. And I thought, why not do that within a community and a space that I really love? Um, so that's kind of what was going through my head at the time. I think that's really cool how that it all is, aligned. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a major factor throughout your entire life is mm-hmm. bringing people together. And now music's involved with that. The 710 stage as difficult of, uh, a, I guess an arc, like a little arc yeah. of that was, it bred so much opportunity for, for both of us. Right. Yeah. Like, um, we got you got connected with everyone here at Trifecta through Seven Ten, exactly. and was 100%. able to build your own team and your own organization. And you guys are fucking killing it. Thank you. Um, and likewise with Kumo too. Like we brought like a insane collective of people together that are so talented and have got such good hearts. And like I think like it's just like a very warm team. You know, like 100%. everyone is very welcoming. Like everyone loves each other, and everyone has is like is is down to put in the work and like make things happen and like that's not something that you see too too often in local in organizations so that despite all the hardships of like dealing with those late nights and and personnel issues uh, i think it was a very like, it was a is a necessary uh process that we had to go through to to get to where we are today and it's a huge stepping stone too i mean exactly like exactly what you said we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that amazing opportunity at Studio 710. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it's closed down right now, but um, it was such a great place to learn. Um, what were the, some of the biggest things that you learned at Studio 710? Um, whether it's dealing with um, or managing teams, motivating teams, or you know, planning small events, live mm-hmm. streams and, and patio events and whatnot? Um, the, the biggest thing that I learned was just like digital marketing, I right. think. Um, and like creating awareness online uh about you know these live streams and stuff through like graphic design and and like recaps and videos and like building hype and all this stuff um because when i first started dude like i had no clue what i was doing like i just hopped on canva found a uh a template and just like put it up there like (laughs) i was just i don't know what i'm doing like let's just try this let's just like explore what this has to do um and so I think it, it was really awesome to be able to like kind of have a playground to like play with and learn mm-hmm. and like almost it was almost better like not having like a teacher or a class that I went through where it was just right. like this is how you do things this is right. a conventional way it was more just like it was more driven by like my own curiosity and what I thought and what I knew was working and I think that was a lot more effective because I could take into consideration the things that were working with the organization in Kumo at the time and play on its strengths rather than being like, oh, this doesn't align with, or like, th- like, but the book says this, right? Uh, and it doesn't really like align with what, what Kumo is doing, right? It was like a very, it was a lot more like organic. Right. It was an, a lot more organic way to learn in, in a, for, for what it needed, right? right? Um, and yeah. things moved very fast. I mean, we were doing at least two, two, one to two to maybe even three things per week. And like there were big productions or big yeah. events. So um, how did you stay on top of it all? How were you staying sane and staying organized? <laughs> well, it's like I wasn't really doing anything else at the time because right. um, I was riding the government's tail for serve. Like, shout out, shout out, <laughs> shout out to federal uh, revenue agency, <laughs> keeping us all alive out here. Um, but yeah, like I think at the time there just wasn't really much else going on. So like I could focus a lot of my attention and a lot of my energy there. Um, and uh, the one of the things that like, kind of kept me sane and organized was just um, 
like I developed a process over the like the last three, four or five years of like how is it able to like people always ask me like how the hell are you able to do like as much as you do? And I answer them it's just like I just like I just like like I just create my weeks on and and figure out what it is and give myself time and space to figure out what it is that I want to accomplish that week. Right. And I think breaking it down into like uh like I, I break it down by like what do I want to do like every at the start of every year I'm always like okay these are the these are the things these are kind of the spaces in my life that I want to work on what do I want to do with them and then you break it down into like monthly goals like every month you reapproach you look at your goals that you, st- you set at the beginning of the year and every month you assess where you are and where you want to be and then you break those further down in, into weekly goals and so every week what I do is I'll sit down for maybe an hour or so and look at the different areas of my life where I'm kind of at with all those things how I'm personally feeling and um you know, assess what I'm capable or what I think I'm capable of doing within that week. Um, and then you just like, I just put everything in a calendar. I like, love that. I, I think a lot of people, I think a few people have seen my calendar and like yeah. how like <laughs> hectic it is. Dude, it's full. It is, it is no. packed. But like what, it, what a lot of people don't realize is there's, there's also a lot of time for like space and leisure and like relaxation as well. You know, like I scheduled that in as well. Cause I'm like type A, like need to know everything that's going on by the, by the minute, like mm-hmm. what I've been doing. Right. So, uh, that's just how like my brain works and that's, and it's helped me be able to do like everything that I've been able to do so far. I love that. Mm-hmm. I love that. Um, I, I know when I was scheduling out my, um, my weeks and when I started that habit, my mm-hmm. biggest stressor was, um, you know, missing a block or, you know, oh, yeah. sleeping in. And so everything got pushed down a bit. Oh you yeah. Know? How do you deal with those um, setbacks? I think you got to be like flexible with your schedule. Um, luckily for me, like a lot of my schedule isn't like hardwired. Like obviously there are some like non-negotiables, like meetings, for example, mm-hmm. or or um, you know where where I need to be like at a certain place at a certain time. Like those things are aren't movable. But there's tons of things for myself where things can be flexible and things can be moved. You know, like a lot of um, like the pers- the personal stuff, like like creating music, you know. Right. Um, usually, I try to like slot out like an hour a day for creating music, um, and sometimes when I don't have time, like just that hour has to get like kicked out, right? right? Um, which is also great because it kind of shows me like where my priorities are in this very moment. I realize mm-hmm. that like I've kind of just been neglecting music because mm-hmm. I've had so many other things going on, right? Um, or or like I'll slot out time to do like specific like I'll I'll set out like amount of time to like do accomplish a certain task right like um, whether it's like create a video or create a marketing plan or whatever like that um, and sometimes like like uh, those will have to move move down or like I'll have to do like a later night like it's just about being like flexible and like being able to move the pieces around to fit your needs right right and like. There are some days where I'll just like, I just like get up and I'm just like, nope, this isn't <laughs> happening. Like, I'm just clear the rest of my day and yeah. just like relax because like right. I need it. And I think what it comes down to is just like being very self aware of where you are in that, in that current moment. Because mm-hmm. um, I think it's a lot better to do, uh, I'd, I'd rather do three hours of work at 100% than eight hours at 60. Right. You know what I mean? Um, you're just going to get a lot more done. Exactly. No, that's super true. Um, so, yeah, I really like, I think scheduling is a huge part of being effective and mm-hmm. being, um, you know, making sure you're on task. Um, but another big part is motivation. I mean, like you said, sometimes you need to, sometimes you need to reschedule a certain brainstorming session because you need a lot of brain power for that. Yeah. And so sometimes your brain is just, it's just not working. You know, it's been, it's been exhausted of its willpower. It's been exhausted of its energy from a full day of, of mm-hmm. making decisions. So um, what's your way of dealing with motivation? Is it, is it, um, planning for it so making sure that you have enough energy and plan things in a way where you know you'll have enough energy to deal with that or is it more pushing where it's like okay i'm gonna push myself through this in this moment i think uh, for me anyways like it really comes down to like knowing who i am as a person and knowing which tasks i like need self-motivation to do versus Mm -hmm. which tasks have external factors that like need to get done and and personally for me like i find myself like i don't have a lot of self-motivation after like six seven o'clock with my current Mm -hmm. schedule right now so i won't schedule anything past that that requires like my personal motivation like like making music or like you know these personal projects because i know i'm just gonna like be like ah like i I can just do it tomorrow you know what i mean but like when there is like an external pressure like a deadline or something that needs to get done for another organization then i'll put those tasks later in the day because 
at that point, the, the pressure of it needing to get done, well, like, I don't need motivation to do that. Like, it's, it's literally like, it needs to get done. There's no other option, right? So um, just finding and figuring out what those things are for yourself can really help you um, get more done in a day. But you do have to be careful with these kind of things because, like, I've just noticed myself, I get, like, burnt out really, really, I, very, very often. You know what I mean? And, like, I don't give myself enough, like, days off. So um, just being, like, aware of these things. It's, it's all, like, practice. So I'm still learning. I, I, I don't know what my balance is yet. It's different every week. <laughs> I know, I feel that. I love that ex internal external thing, though. I think mm -hmm. that's, I, I didn't even think about it in that way, and that's really, really cool. Yeah. Music career, I mean, a lot of people are, are trying um, to test out a music career in their life, and I think the biggest problem for a lot of people is, is how do you even get started? Like, what do you start with? Do you start with your brand? Do you start with just making music? Do you start going to school? Like, how would you approach getting started if you were to go back at the beginning of your music producing career? Um, how would you approach getting started with that? Ah, uh, like the music's got to come first, man. Yeah. I think, I think before anything, like you can't have a brand without a product, right? Like what's like, 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 like take, um, like McDonald's, for example, you know, they've, they've got a phenomenal brand. It, it, the food isn't what is the reason why you go to McDonald's. It's right. the thing around it. Right? right. But like you wouldn't go to McDonald's if they didn't have any food. Right. Like exactly. what's the point? So I think, I think a lot of people overlook that and they like stress about, oh, like I need to have a brand or like, oh, I need to build this empire around this thing that i don't even have right like um and i think so i think the music definitely comes first and okay. just like being able to like have something that you're like proud of putting out mm -hmm. right and sharing with people and so when you have um that thing you feel confident about it, you, mm. you're i mean you're as confident as you can be in something that is untested right right you have your music you have your style you know you have an instagram account yeah for example your personal instagram account yeah. How would you go about building that so that people know mm. you for um, as a music producer? Right. Well, I mean, you just got to create content around your music, right? right. Like, and right. show people that you are creating music. You know, it could literally be like one of those corny stories where like you've got your phone in the screen and it's just like new banger coming out soon or whatever, <laughs> right? Like, right. Or however you want to express yourself, I think you really need to figure out, and, and it comes to like self awareness again, right? Like, you really need to figure out who you are as a person and find a way that you feel comfortable sharing your art and your work. Um, but like, no one's gonna know that you make music unless you share it, right? So right. I think that's what really what comes down to it. And once you've got that figured out, then you can start tacking on other things like your interests and like who you are as a person. Because I think a lot of your music will be influenced by uh, the various, uh, your, your, your other areas in your life, right? Like if you're super into fitness, for example, and you love kayaking or you love being in the outdoors or whatever maybe you like make ambient music and um if you can find the connection between those two things and and create content with both of those things those things will both like support each other you know what i mean like people who also like nature will be like oh this guy's music is very in tune with like nature -y stuff right or or uh yeah this, this or vice versa find the parallels yeah find the parallels yeah i mean there's so many people i know that um there's so many people I know that make music, but you would have no idea that they make music because they never say anything about it. So I think the most important thing to get started, like you said, is to just tell the world in mm. the best way and the way you feel most comfortable with that you are making music, you are a producer, you're yeah. doing something with music. I think, I think the, people, the thing that people get strung up about is just like making like the perfect pitch for something or like making that like perfect video or whatever. But it's like, you gotta realize, man, like, they're gonna forget about what you just did in like 30 seconds right? right like no one cares about what you're doing unless they're like emotionally invested into what you're doing right um and i think it was about i think i heard somewhere it's like it takes about seven interactions with whatever your skill is or your music is for people to create that emotional attachment right like someone needs to hear your song seven times for them to be like okay yeah like this is this has emotional value to me now cool Seven rule. The seven yeah. times rule. Seven, seven times rule, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this next round is, is called top three. Sweet. Um, and so um, I'm going to ask you a question, and you're just going to name the top three things that come to mind when I ask you that question. Cool, right? let's do it. Um, so the first question I have here is top three people you would like to be mentored by. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, definitely Gary, Gary Vee, I think, nice. would be an awesome one. Uh, just his like views on life is amazing. 
uh, or just his his views on like the current like digital space and like how to like an entrepreneurship is 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 nuts. Um, and I, I definitely draw a lot of inspiration from that. I mean, my dad, he's been my biggest mentor, but like still teaches me so many, so many lessons. Like even to this day, like I'm still learning so much about him. And I think it's because he's lived such a rich, beautiful life. And as yeah, he's just 28 years old. He's lived 28 more years of life than I have. And I feel like he's got like a lot to offer. So I think that's uh, another good one. And then the last one would probably be, yeah, I don't have a third. No? Uh, I okay. Two. Well, maybe it'll line up with the next one here. Top yeah. three producers you'd want to party with. Party? Mm. Oh, Fisher, for sure. <laughs> this, he just seems like an animal. Yeah. Um, and just like doesn't really care and just looks like the, like, the most fun. Uh, I would love to party with someone like Flume because it's super eccentric and just I like I'm in love with their music style and just it's so different and I just want to see how his like brain works you know like yeah. he's not the kind of guy that I go get drunk with he's the kind of guy I'd sit down and have like dinner and wine with you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> like I just want to like pick his brain and then the last person that I'd want to party with is um it's a it's a, it's a good one let's see these are good questions my friend um <laughs> Probably Alice in Wonderland because Ooh. she's she's she's, I mean she's she's an she's another Australian like those people not a party and it's just I feel like, uh she she would just she wouldn't be like the type of person that would go crazy I feel like she's the kind of person that might like, cry at the party have some like very insightful like life like you'd have great life talks with her you know I love that, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> bathroom talks bathroom talks for real, <laughs> um okay so the next one's a bit more serious here top three yeah. anxieties that you realized were unfounded. So top three things that you might have stressed about and later realized, like, why did I even worry about that? Um, definitely where I'm at in my life. <laughs> like, uh, that's that's definitely a huge one because I know, like, no, like, I'm, I'm 24 and, like, you're not supposed to have it figured out when you're 24. Like, maybe the point top 1% of the 1% does at our, at our age. But, like, in reality, it's like no one knows what they're doing, right? So I think... Um, just that that is a big one just being stressed about where you are in life um another big anxiety factor uh definitely relationship anxiety i got a lot of relationship anxiety um i think uh just as like past experiences and stuff um i always think like i'm always like suspicious that my my partner is like cheating on me and stuff when in reality it's like that's just all in my own damn head and uh, the, the other biggest anxiety that I think I have is, is um, just like comparing myself to people and being like, oh, like I should be there or like, oh, like I should be as good as this person. Like I'm putting in just as much work. And it really comes down like, no, no, you, you, you're not. You guys are different, different people, different walks of life. Like you don't know where they came from. Like just compete with yourself. I love so, that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Top three things you wish you did sooner. Uh, I wish I got into music sooner, sooner that's for <laughs> sure. I wish I had like, yeah. Uh, the next in five years. <laughs> well, like if I got into music when I was 12 when I had so much more time on my hands, like, right. bro, like I would be a phenomenal producer mm -hmm. now. You know what I mean? Um, so that's, that's one. Uh, definitely wish I got into financial literacy a little bit sooner. Uh, I feel like uh not not to bash my parents or anything but like they they definitely didn't introduce me to the important aspects of it and now it's like i'm having to learn it at 24 and i feel like i'm a little bit behind even though i'm not um so i wish i did that and then um the last thing is i wish i learned how to cook for myself a little sooner like my because like growing up i had my mom cook meals for me all the time and then when i was at university we had a chef so it was just like i didn't really have to learn to fend for myself until i graduated when i was like 22 23 and like Man, like you should know how to cook for yourself by that, at least a little bit. <laughs> at so. least some scrambled eggs. Yeah, something. Yeah. I saw you like on your Instagram, you're cooking a lot. You're just oh yeah, to pick yeah. it up a lot more. Yeah, it's it's like therapeutic for me now. That's like cool. I figured it out. I, like I, I mean, it's funny I say that because I worked in like cactus club when I was oh. 16 for a year, <laughs> but I still just didn't know how to cook like proper yeah. food other than like that kind of stuff. But yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, top three boat post event grub spots in Vancouver. Oh, Megabyte Pizza. Hundred percent. You, you know, I was gonna say Megabyte, just because it's like the heart of downtown. Um, smokes poutinery. Oh, oh yeah. so good. And um, probably the last one would probably be like any Donaire spot on Granville. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Donaire's is so popular. I remember putting a poll up on my story, and mm -hmm. Donaire's beat out sushi. 
I was what? so surprised. Was what like, time did you put it at? That's another, that's another <laughs> fact. <today>. A weekend that's <laughs> yeah. Saturday for sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, top three mistakes you have, uh, okay, so top three mistakes you see happen in the event promoting space. Um, definitely ego and just, just having like a big head about everything. Um, this goes for like everyone in the event space, like DJs, artists, organizers, promoters, all that. Like I just see there's too much of it and, and like it really dilutes what the event space should really be about in my opinion. Um, a lot of, I think not enough is being done to like, uh, protect patrons, especially like women in the space and stuff. I think as things open up, um, like we haven't been exposed to it, uh, these things as much, like, even though like there's been a lot of like education online, like I just feel like real world implication, like we, aren't trained to like watch for that or like really worry about that as much. So I think that's going to be, that's something that people should definitely focus on. And then the last thing is just, um, bad business, dude, like people just not getting paid and, um, not, you know, fulfilling their promises and stuff like, and like, I know the event space is like a super dynamic spot, but like, don't ever promise anything that you can't deliver on or else you're going to burn bridges mm. for sure. Like that's, a, that's, a, that's a point I definitely try and like, um emphasize is like even if you have to go out of pocket like i'd rather save face than than make a bit of money yeah at the end of the day because because you can always make more money but you can't really like you can't mend a broken relationship right um last question uh on mm -hmm. the top three is top three people you want to see on this podcast top three people that i want to see oh cal cal from the plug for sure for i sure. think he'd be an awesome guest he's got t tons super insightful um great at like he's built an insane community over the last like two years and has uh, built like an incredibly loyal fan base and a loyal team and i think dissecting into that he'd have a lot of insight into that um i would love for you to uh interview or have nostalgics on here just as a music producer uh who's just like killed it in the scene and is like i think is leading the industry in the uh electronic music space anyways in vancouver and um well maybe like maybe like boslin or something from his crew too because that's like the, it's like more on the hip-hop side but like he's definitely like making waves um so yeah those are those would be my top three suggestions for you i love it i love boslin too because he came from the same hometown and it's so interesting to see people who grew up in a very small community and how they how they motivated themselves and built themselves up to where they, mm -hmm. who they are today so yeah definitely that's awesome um, lastly, before we leave off, um, is, you know, what's a message, you know, if you could put a billboard up in the busiest city in the world, what, what kind of message would you want to put on that from yourself? For, for people to read? For people to read and just look at every day. Uh, oh, there's like a couple, there's a couple of good ones. <laughs> uh, I think, I think, I think the biggest one would probably be, um, like it goes it goes back to what i was saying where it's like you don't have to have it all figured out right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. just focus on what you can do today and get that done i love that focus yeah. on today it's about the process it's all about the just trust that you are on the right path and that whatever it is like as long as you got that like that feeling that i mentioned before that this mm -hmm. makes you feel good and this is what you want to do and you're following that and you're taking steps toward that feeling on a daily basis like i can guarantee like however long however much time down the road, like it'll all work itself out and it'll all make sense. Even if it doesn't make sense right now. Wise words. Yeah. Thanks so much cool. for coming on the podcast. Man. Thank you for having me, man. This is <laughs> a lot of fun. I, I, I don't think I've smiled this much in front of a camera <laughs> for, for a, a while. Good <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, That's it. Take it easy guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>